next up, we've got someone that I'm really thrilled uh, to see in person and meet in person. Uh, any of you ever go to TED? TED, raise your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone go to TED last year? TED last year, I saw a demo uh, from this next company that just blew me away. Uh, their uh, founder, Mayron, um, did a virtual, uh, did an augmented reality demonstration with two people in different places, himself and his co-founder, where they passed objects between themselves, they blew things up, they touched them, they collaborated, all in 3D space. And when Meta offered to speak here at scale for our first time, we jumped at the opportunity. Um, there's not gonna be a demo of, this, of the technology here, but outside you're gonna be able to wear the headset and test it and to really see what happens. But please welcome from Meta, the Vice President of Partnerships and Strategy, Ryan Pamplin. Ryan. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome, welcome. Do you need this? Yes, that'd be great. Great to be here with all of you. I am holding a Meta 2, which I'll pull out in a few minutes and, and show you what it looks like on. It's very fashionable, I assure you. Uh, so I'm Ryan Pamplin, and I'm from Meta, and I have been very passionate and very excited about augmented reality for, for quite a while. So I call this how the world will see in 2020, which is a pun, and I can assure you is the worst joke I'll make. Uh, so this is me back when I was seven years old, and I had a childhood dream that someday the glasses that I got when I was seven would have my computer inside of them. And I've been waiting for the day that the technology and my imagination end up in the same place, and I'm very excited to tell you that that time is now. And augmented reality a few years ago looked like this. This was my first experience with AR. This was the Meta One, which was actually a Kickstarter, and I got it. I think I was the sixth person to buy it. I wasn't at Meta yet, but I was extremely excited. And to be very honest, it was very terrible. Uh, it was roughly a 40 degree field of view, similar to what HoloLens is today. And the edges were cut off and it was, you know, it was rough, but it showed me that the future was coming. It was going to happen. We were going to have holograms in my lifetime. And that was very, very exciting to me. And through some crazy circumstances, I ended up connecting with the founders when they were just a bunch of crazy people in a mansion. Uh, and they showed me the prototype of Meta 2 that was literally made with duct tape. Uh, and it had a 90 degree field of view and it blew my mind because it was like virtual reality on top of the real world. And that is like something that no one had ever seen before. And I knew from that moment I had to stop everything else I was doing and figure out how to become an integral part of this future. So what we're doing at Meta is really bringing augmented reality to life, not for the sake of augmented reality, but for the sake of a more natural computing experience something that works far closer to how the real world works than how any digital device has ever worked before. Today, we're very limited by the dimensions of our screens. Even the big iPhone is very small relative to our human field of view. And we're making these design concessions where we're stuffing menus and buttons and boxes into these very small screens, and we're driving the learning curve up to a point that makes it difficult for people to learn how to use. And it doesn't have to be this difficult. And it doesn't even seem that difficult to most of us because we're used to it. But when you see the alternatives that work more like the real world, it starts to become apparent how difficult these devices actually are. So what we want to do with Meta is kill the Meta 4, but not the Meta 4 when that comes out. We want that to be very successful. We're 3D creatures. Our data is so often 3D, but our screens are all flat. And this information can be presented in a far more natural way if we can see it the way that it's actually created in 3D. And ultimately, what I'm talking about is creating a computing device that works as a natural extension of you, something that you're not stuck down looking at and conforming to, but instead something that is putting a beautiful digital layer on top of the real world that is contextually relevant to you, to your friends, to your family, to where you're going, to what you're doing, to your hobbies, your interests. Imagine being able to drive down the road if you're looking for a new home and literally seeing outside of the homes that are for sale a virtual for sale sign. You're wearing glasses not so different than these. Maybe your significant other is wearing glasses not so different than these. And 
you see these virtual for sale signs and you tap on one and now you see the interior of the home and now you go into VR mode and now you're getting a virtual tour of the inside of the house. Imagine you're leaving here and you need an Uber, so you reach down into your holographic tool belt, you pull up your Uber application, it launches, you see a 3D terrain map in front of you, you drop a pin where you want to go, when the Uber comes it shows you a path on the ground to the car. You see the car, it has an outline, you know that's the car you're supposed to get into, the driver knows you're his passenger because you have an arrow over the top of your head telling him so. You get in the car, the driver's not looking down like this, almost running red lights and hitting people. Instead, he's looking at the road, still probably almost hitting people and running red lights, but at least he's looking at the road in front of him and there's a dotted line showing him exactly where to go. This is how we envision the digital world and the physical world becoming one and the same. Instead of, even for us diehard technologists, being stuck like this, I don't want this anymore. I love technology, but I'm sick of this and this and running into things. I want more human connection. So when I say layer, I really should say layers because there's probably a layer for Uber, there's probably a layer for Zillow, there's probably one for Yelp, there's probably one for your job. Uh, and I think we'll have shared digital layers and private digital layers. And uh, what we're really talking about is a future where my children, which I don't have yet, will someday go, wait a minute, you used to sit all day in front of a box and the internet was stuck inside of the box? <laughs> no way. It's going to be so hard for them to understand that we were so archaic at one point. And you know, the technology hasn't been there to bring this future to life until now. The hardware exists. It's a development kit, but it exists to a point that now the developers, tens of thousands of them, can get their hands on the technology to create the applications and the tools and the experiences that will make it, when it gets to this form factor, desirable for all of us to actually wear every day and use. And it's not something that's competing, you know, the meta versus the HoloLens versus the magic leap. It's all of us versus the paradigm of computing that exists today, the flat box on your desk, the rectangle in your pocket. And what we're really talking about, this is the Meta 2, by the way, which I'll show you how fashionable it is now. So this is a tethered device today. It is a dev kit, but it's three times the field of view of anything else out there, like the HoloLens, and it's one-third the price. So what this really means is it's very, very accessible for developers. There's more pre-orders for this than I think there are HoloLenses in the world. And this is good news not just for Meta, but for the whole ecosystem, because what this means is really talented people are going to get this technology this year, and they're going to create all of those things that are going to pave the way for the future of our entire industry. And I think this will dramatically accelerate the adoption. And there's a lot of really cool technologies I could talk about in here, like a sensor bar that scans the world and makes a 3D map in real time, or an HD front-facing camera, or a depth sensor to track your hands. You can touch the holograms directly. Uh, and of course, this uh, industry-leading optical engine that we created, uh, because no one else did, that gives you that 90-degree field of view. So what this really means is a very immersive experience. And I do have to say thank you to my friend Pikachu because prior to Pokemon Go, the augmented reality term was not really widely understood outside of probably this room and a few other rooms in Silicon Valley. Uh, and now it's very widely understood that this is something that has the propensity to shift us all from the devices we use today. The real competitors of augmented reality are the phone in your hand, the laptop on your lap, the computer on your desk, the TV on your wall. Uh, and I think thanks to Pikachu and Pokemon Go, people are more aware of this now, even if it's not the greatest AR experience in the world. It gives them a taste. So, Something that's fundamentally different about our approach, it's not just AR for the sake of AR, it's AR for the sake of this more natural human experience. And we think one area that you really have to nail is understanding how humans interact with the digital world really well. So Apple has their design, human interface, design guidelines, which are great for the apps. And if you look at the apps across their ecosystem, they have a consistent feel and they work in predictable ways, and that's very nice. Well, there is no equivalent of that yet for spatial interface design, a 3D interface, right? We're not just taking windows and putting it on your face. 
uh, we're sort of reinventing how computing works in, in a volumetric way. So the ability to touch and grab and move things around, we have to rethink how interfaces are designed. And we actually have a neuroscience team led by a world-renowned neuroscientist, Stefano Baldassi from Stanford, and a team of neuroscientists working under him to study how humans interact with machines and the real world and computers and digital devices. And we've come up with what we call spatial interface design guidelines. And we unveiled those at South by Southwest. And these are open source for developers to take and use and create applications that are going to be very natural to interact with. If I want to pick something up like this, let's say, I just reach out and I grab it and I move it around. It has affordances that tell me how to do this. I know exactly how to do this because I'm a human. That's how we want to make the interfaces in augmented reality work. That's how we want to make the applications work. Uh, and we're really excited to evangelize this. And you know what? If Microsoft copies this and adopts this and Magic Leap does, fantastic. The world will be a better place for it. We'll have much more natural interactions with our machines. This is a real video shot through the Meta headset, literally just taking a camera and putting it behind the lens. This is a uh, MRI scan of a real human brain being visualized inside of the Meta using the Meta technology. And you'll see from the first person perspective in a moment as well. And if I wear the glasses and you wear the glasses, we'll actually see the same things from our own perspectives and we can touch and interact with these collaboratively as well. For medical imaging, this is very exciting, but for any kind of 3D visualization and for the future of entertainment and so many different use cases, this is so exciting. There's really no industry that won't be affected by this technology. This is a demo that up until a few weeks ago you would have had to sign an NDA to see, but I'm happy to get to share it with you now. So this is all again real, shot through the headset just with a camera behind the lens, no post-production or anything like that. And this is a, a demo that we built to show how you can extend an, an existing device like an iPad. And in this case, you see we're pulling objects out of the iPad. We're very dexterously manipulating what we call the cube of cubes directly with our hands. And this is with no external tracking. This is literally a laptop, a headset, and uh, in this case, an iPad, and, and you, and that's it. One of the other really cool things we can start to think about is, you know, on the path to completely displacing all of these devices, you already are shopping on an iPad. How can we enhance that experience? Well, maybe the shoe comes out of the iPad. Maybe the shoe is something you can take and put on the ground. Maybe you can step into it. Maybe you can configure it to different colors, and you can actually order a completely custom-designed shoe uh, right from this experience, actually getting to try it on and see what it'll look like. The hardware for all of this exists now, and it's really up to the developers, and it's up to us to get it in the hands of the developers who are going to make all of these big dreams come true. And you'll hear announcements in the coming weeks uh, and months about some of the really big companies who are jumping on board and building some unbelievable experiences that even blow me away. This is one of my favorite things to do. This is a collaborative drawing in mid-air. So I can see what I'm drawing, you can see what I'm drawing, and we can do it together in person in the same room. And when you're thinking in 3D and you're designing a product, you're often sort of translating into 2D on a whiteboard. In this case, you think in 3D, you draw in 3D, everyone sees it in 3D. It's a pretty exceptional experience that I, I can't really describe to you how freeing it is to, to just be able to draw in midair, uh, especially when you're trying to sketch out what you want an interface to look like in 3D or design a product. And one of the most fascinating things that gives me chills, because the sense of presence is closer to being in person than anything else I can describe to you, is the ability to do holographic communication in real time. This is real, it exists today. You can pop out of the iPad or you can be life-size in front of me, head to toe, 360 degrees, and I can be here, and you can be in San Francisco or vice versa, or even further away, and we can have this real-time communication, see each other, and even collaborate on a drawing together. I think that's gonna transform business and entertainment in so many different ways that we connect with the world, with our digital world, with each other, most importantly. So a little secret for you is the form factor, it's gonna be a strip of glass by 2020. Design is gonna differentiate. You know, the Snapchat glasses already have, what, three different colors? So they're already starting to play in AR with their app and you're gonna to start to see everyone with great optical engines, just like all of our phones have great screens, everybody's gonna have great optics. This is really about disrupting mobile, right? My real competitor is the iPhone. 
I need to be as useful as that in order to take people's attention and time away. And I've got to do what you already do so much better that you don't want to go back to the old way. And that's how AR will drive this paradigm shift and turn the whole world into your desktop background. And what I'm really talking about is true usefulness. There was an application called VisiCalc for the Apple II, and that drove a lot of sales. I see some shaking heads. So you guys remember this. Before VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet application, Apple II for business users was OK, but it became very popular because of this. And the reason is the alternative was a paper binder called a ledger with a pencil and an eraser. And the accounting went from that to a machine. No one is going to go back to the old way because it's so much better. That's the bar of excellence for these early use cases that are gonna ha we're going to have to have as an industry to drive adoption to this new platform and make people actually want to wear this. I'll touch on quickly some of the future technologies that are going to get us from this thing to these things. So by 2030, we could actually transcend glasses. This is interesting and a little crazy, but I actually got to try a computer brain interface where I could think H-I space R-Y-A-N exclamation mark send, and it actually is able to read your thoughts and translate to letters in real time. And this is something that I saw under NDA, so I can't tell you who it is, but it's going to be released as a dev kit in the very near future for developers to start to play around with. So you can only imagine, given another five or 10 years, where we're going to be. 5G, we're going to get multi-gigabit uh, sub-millisecond latency, so very fast file transfers with low battery, which means I don't need all the processing in the glasses. The processing can happen in the cloud. And we're all going to have these photorealistic optics because of this processing in the cloud and because of the uh, sort of ability to have scalable compute. You know, if you need really fancy graphics, you can use the scalable compute for that. If you need something lightweight, you can use that. And you don't necessarily have to have it all on board. And the computer vision algorithms are going to get crazy really quickly. Uh, to enable all of this sort of scanning of the world. And imagine all of us wearing these sensors around. We're all making 3D maps. We can merge all those 3D maps in the cloud. There's a lot of interesting things that can be done with that. There's also a lot of privacy concerns that I think we all have to think about. And very quickly, in terms of use cases, what gets me really excited is volumetric video. Imagine having your favorite movie play out right in front of you and be able to walk around and see it like the actors are really there with you in your living room or your favorite band or sitting at a table the size of a basketball court and actually seeing the players running around in real time. And it's like you're sitting courtside, except they're the size of Barbie dolls. 3D design is already a killer use case. There's a plug-in integration, uh, SolidWorks integration, so you can see your 3D models in real time already as holograms and interact with them collaboratively. For gaming, of course, this is going to be huge. We could all run around playing laser tag with each other. I think we're more focused on being productive, but certainly developers will create these things. For education, being able to see every great work of art uh, or to learn the human anatomy and see a life-size body that you can pick every layer apart for medical, to actually learn surgery with a virtual cadaver and a real scalpel to be able to cut open a body right in front of you. For training, whether you're an astronaut going to outer space and learning how to do a space walk with another astronaut and having the ability to see them and not just be closed off in virtual reality in a training simulation, this is a big deal to these guys. Complex assembly, whether you're assembling an IKEA cabinet or you're building a plane for a giant airliner, uh, this really dramatically will improve the speed at which things are put together and the accuracy that they're put together. For retail, maybe you want to see that Tesla Model 3 before it's out, and you can actually walk into a showroom and walk around and see it as if it's really there and even sit in a seat that's positioned perfectly where the driver's seat is, and you can even touch the infotainment system and get a feel for what the car is really going to be like. E-commerce, look in a mirror, see the clothing right on your body, place the furniture in your living room. And even today, monitor replacement. In my own office, I wear this headset, and I've replaced my 27-inch cinema display, and I use my Mac with a monitor that you guys don't see unless you're wearing a headset because it's floating there virtually in front of me. And if I need an extra screen, I just add one, and it's there instantly. The Internet of Things to have the smart factories with all the diagnostics coming off the machinery as you're walking through the factory and just seeing it come out in real time. And for my smart home where I have way too many hue bulbs because I'm addicted to them and I can change every light to whatever color, to be able to just touch it and change it to any color without having to remember what one of the 50 light bulbs is called, that is, I think, the future interface of how we'll control our smart homes and offices. And of course, for government, whether it's city planning or training or data visualization, to see a grid of the city and see all the analytics real time of the city as traffic is flowing and all of the 
uh, municipalities have their data reporting in, you can sort of see a live virtual version of the city. And one of my very favorites I already hit on is communication. To be able to see people today is mind-blowing as a hologram, and to communicate in this way opens up bandwidth that I don't think we've ever had before except for in person, and I'm very excited for those implications. What I'm trying to get across to you is not what AR is for, but that the possibilities are endless. There's so much that it can do. I really don't see a future where everything that we know and love today isn't affected, especially things that we already use our digital devices for. Uh, and I think in a couple years we'll be kissing our phones and our laptops and our TVs goodbye and welcoming in this new world of augmented reality. So I thank you so much for having me.